Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a great opportunity, of course, and then um, also s being the first one on the first day, uh, that means you, you have, well, or we have plenty of opportunities to keep discussing during the next few days. So that's cool. And um, yeah, so, so there's this book. Uh, if you want to have a look, uh, maybe you can pass it through. Um, yeah, you know, once you write it, then you want that people uh, read it. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy about feedback, also about negative feedback. So maybe there will be a second edition at some time, and then I can improve something. So yeah, uh, thank you again uh, for, for creating this opportunity, for inviting me, but also like to organize all of this. And then like, it's really nice to have these workshop style events, uh, just as Christian said, uh, it gives you this big opportunity to, to really <coughs> dive deep into something, discuss and uh, stay in touch. Um, well, yeah, now that you already had this beautiful introduction, so uh, just here a, a little map uh, where I don't show you everything because did you actually mention that? No, yeah, so I was also a few months in, in Oregon at some time, so I didn't put that on the map because then everything else would shrink. Uh, but you see it up there uh, at the coast. Uh, it's a beautiful city, Lübeck, if you don't know it. Um, I'm always saying uh, when, when we have a, a vote in Germany, what's the nicest city, then uh, usually Hamburg is on top. But if you look at what ham hamburgers uh, do when on a, on a, <laughs> on a sunny, weekend, they drive to Lübeck. To <laughs> <laughs> uh, so maybe you want to see it and, and it's really beautiful. And yeah, so <laughs> Karlsruhe, Stuttgart, and so I'm, I'm really happy uh, that I spent some time in Austria, beautiful Austria. Uh, this, however, was Graz, so that's the, the Steiermark. And here we are in Canton in Corinthia. And this is, of course, the, the nicest picture I found of Lübeck. Uh, the weather is not always like that, but well, today, uh, here it's also not so so good. Um, so in, uh, I, uh, the idea for today is that I don't really give you an overview. Um, I, we will actually dive into one detail, and I hope most of you like that. Uh, if you don't, sorry. Uh, but I've heard that, for example, Icario will give a nice kind of overview talk on, on the last day. Um, so maybe then, then you have to stay patient for a while. Uh, so now that also Christian mentioned um, this, this EU project, I want to uh, just spend a, a few minutes to, to introduce you to that. It's, it's like really uh, marginal, so it's not my, my main theme for today. But it's, um, well, it was a great project. It actually ended in March this year, Flora Robotica, where we put together a distributed, if you like, self-organizing robot system and natural plants. And so what, can, what could you do with such a, such a system? Well, you could automate a, a greenhouse, but that would be boring, although the, the Dutch would really love that. Um, but our inspiration came from, from this kind of research. So there's a really nice uh, research um, going on, or well, this is from, from some years ago, uh, where people combined mobile robots and cockroaches, for example, or these robots and, and young chickens to actually influence them. So this is what, what they call, well, what we call it biohybrid system, but back then they also called it mixed system or mixed societies uh, where you combine robots with living organisms, right? And then you can, for example, here, this is a, actually a science paper where they showed that the aggregation behavior of these cockroaches is really changed. So they aggregate in an unnatural way uh, so not under the uh, this shield where they would usually aggregate. So you can really influence these, these animals with robots. And that was our inspiration for this project. So we said, okay, people do that with animals. What about this other kind of living organism that is very often ignored, which is natural plants? And then again, not automation of greenhouses, but something more fancy. Uh, this is a really nice example. These are li the living root bridges from India, where, where these uh, locals there use these a bit weird roots of these trees to form bridges. And you can maybe imagine that such a bridge 
Um, that, that's actually a clever idea in the jungle, right? Because the, the climate is actually quite extreme, high humidity. So if you would work with steel as material, maybe you would not be so happy in, in the long run. And there's a paper um, where they, um, like this is not a measurement, but they, they show it in, in a schematic way. So here you have uh, time with logarithmic scale, and here you have structural resilience of your bridge. And if you build it with, with steel, like what Western Europeans would usually do, then you actually see that this degrades over time, right? So I'm not sure about the infrastructure in Austria, but in Germany it's degrading. All our bridges are 70 to 100 years old. Uh, also in Lübeck we have that problem, so we have many bridges in Lübeck and now they rebuild one after the other, uh, which creates some, some traffic jam. So bring a bike if you come to Lübeck. Uh, bamboo maybe is a good idea, right? Um, like more, more like a natural material, but also that degrades because it's dead wood, right? But with living root bridges, you have a living system with all the opportunities and all the advantages of a living organism. That means it, it keeps growing, um, it renews. It's, uh, so if you have some wear in, in your bridge, for example, um, it will basically self-repair, right? And so over the time, it will grow stronger and bigger and that was our main motivation. So we're not really growing bitches. Uh, we just create very initial um, basic methodology. And here I just show you one uh, or kind of two examples from this kind of research. Um, so this is, uh, well, still we are roboticists. So we do some kind of collision avoidance with plants. And so there's this gray area that the plant should not really touch and the, the target area in orange. And first, we, we, we use quite some machine learning here. So these are LSTM networks to come up with a holistic model for, for the plant. And then uh, we evolve basically some, some co simple controllers. And then we bridge the reality gap. So we go, these are real plants in a, in, what, in a physical world, in this world. And then uh, the, the, the obstacle is actually virtual, but we still uh, manage to steer them um, around these obstacles. So this is like, how can you control uh, motion of plants and the, the directional growth. And this is just another example where um, we have a system. So you as a user, you could like put these little red crosses uh, and then our system, our autonomous system will steer the plant tip into all these, these crosses uh, by just changing the lights, right? So we steer it in this case um, with light and you know that right from, from uh, your place so maybe you have some plants at home and they always grow towards the light right so that's what we call uh, phototropism so it's a, a, a natural adaptive behavior in the plant that we then just exploit and this is just one example we also scaled up we have uh, many plants bigger plants uh, we have different kinds we use different kinds of stimuli not just light um, and this is uh, gives you a rough impression of what we did in this exp uh, in this project and we are just emptying our paper pipeline right now. So um, we have already published a few journal papers this year and, and more are going to follow. Also some nice uh, survey papers. So if you're interested, you can have a look into that uh, and then you learn quite a bit about living architecture. So just, this was just this little marketing part for this project. And now we go into swarm intelligence Swarm Robotics, and then to, to the title, um, so together everybody achieves more, which is a nice motto both for, for our robots, but also for ourselves. <coughs> so maybe, maybe we can make that happen in the next few days. So to have an, uh, an easy introduction, I show you this, this video that I stole from um, Arte. And um, what do you think, what are they doing here? So they pour some liquid into a hole in the ground and now there's some digging involved. Yeah, okay, so some, some already know, so maybe we don't spoil, in a second you will see. So this looks like archaeology, right? Why would I show you a documentary about archaeology? Now they have even bigger devices. Uh, yeah, also, yeah, the cows are actually not that important in this part of the movie. 
And so you can see something, I think in a second you see a bit more. So this is huge, right? And what you see here is actually biologists in the wild and they just poured uh, quite some concrete into an ant colony. Uh, why do they do that? Not to torture ants uh, and kill them, but, well, that's a side effect. But, it, uh, <laughs> but uh, for, for science, it's fine to do that, right? Uh, uh, and uh, I think in, in European law, insects are objects, so you can do anything to them. <coughs> but, so the point here is this architecture, right? This really mm. beautiful architecture, you have these long, like, hallways, these, these tubes, and then you have these chambers. And it's a decentralized system, right? So there's not the, the queen telling everybody, like looking at the blueprint and like you build a chamber here, you build one there. It's um, this system that is purely based on local information, local communication. Each end is, is like very simple. You shouldn't tell, you shouldn't say, you shouldn't say that to a Bauschist because we can't still build ants, uh, but that's the idea. So we have these very simple animals uh, and as a self-organizing decentralized system, they ch still achieve uh, something as beautiful and complex as you just saw. And my, my main point here is not so much about like, trying to fascinate you about all these social insects that we have, but we want to go deep into uh, the following issue, into scalability. So you've seen this, this actually quite huge uh, colony. Uh, I don't actually know the, the species uh, and that's not so important here. There, there's other ant species where they build really huge colonies of uh, 300 million workers or more. Imagine you have to come up with an organization scheme to, to manage 300 million workers and all of them are a bit stupid and uh, are difficult to coordinate, right? So from nature we see this extreme scalability in such a decentralized system and I think it's a really intriguing and interesting question about basically any engineered system if you if you just ask yourself like look around at what, what you see in this world and ask yourself what's this system's maximal scalability? So where are the limits? How, how far can you scale up? And here, just to inspire you a bit, so it doesn't have to be biological, right? You can also look into something like airplanes. And maybe you've seen or uh, even you were on board of uh, the Airbus A380, right? So that seems to be like the biggest we can do right now. Um, it doesn't sell that well anymore, so um, maybe it was not the best idea, who knows? And it seems they will not build a bigger plane soon. But the question is like, does the, the concept of an airplane in, in this uh, way of designing it scale infinitely? Probably not, right? So I'm not an expert, but there are certain things that don't scale linearly. And then also you have at some time problems with, with the materials, right? So you can build a very, very small paper plane. You can build uh, planes from wood, but probably you can't build an A380 from, from wood or um, like these simple materials. And this is now our, our main question for, for this whole talk. Um, how do these systems scale? And we will look, uh, of course, into these swarm systems, not necessarily swarm robotic systems, but decentralized self-organizing systems and how they do actually scale. And then if you look into um, some published experiments, uh, so this is uh, this famous science paper from uh, Radhika Nakpal's group from Harvard University where they do the self-assembly with 1024 kilobots, right? Uh, and probably if you would have asked somebody uh, 30 years ago, is it possible to control 1000 robots at a time? Maybe they would have told you, like, eh, I, I doubt it. But they can actually do that. Uh, and, but it's, you know, it's a well, I shouldn't say it's a simple experiment, but it's not like super complex. And then um, this is some of my own work where we do uh, collective decision making with kilobots, also the same robot, um, fewer robots, so this is just 100, but they uh, move around, they explore their environment, they find about qualities of different options, they communicate with each other and then try to find a consensus about what is the best option. So this is what's already published. 
100 robots, 1,024 robots. The question is how far could you go, right? And we will not talk about numbers for the rest of the talk only, right? So it's, it's not about like, can you go to 10,000, 100,000? We will talk about it in a more systematic way so that I also have quite some hope that this is generic and it will also apply to um, whatever your research is focused on. So here are a few questions that, that we want to try to answer. Um, so here I put swarm robotic <laughs> systems, but you could also put uh, some, some other swarm uh, system. And you should ask yourself at some time, right? So how well is my system actually doing? How do I define performance? How well will it scale? So how do I make it scale uh, would also be a question um, that, that is maybe uh, useful. And then is that scalability robust? So I, I um, often we say in Swarm Robotics, it has these two main advantages that these systems are scalable and that these systems are robust. And I sometimes love to play with these two words and put them together and ask what is actually robust scalability? Uh, because that's not something you, you get for free. And then, well, I said already that, um, well, together you achieve more. So team building, working as a group is, is great and beautiful, but there's also something like interference, right? So if you work with communication, you know, if you put too many uh, antennas into one room, then at some time you will get some, some problems. And maybe similarly, if you think about, um, don't know, how you organized your, your study group at the university, um, if you have like, two, three, four uh, persons, then maybe it works fine. But if you double the group size, usually it doesn't mean that, that you're double uh, effective, right? So this is the, the downside of like, hey, working as a group is cool, but there's also something like a too big group. So mm, there are limits, right? And that's the point here. So if you look into literature, so we, we don't start from, from nothing. So we can have a, a little look into what's out there. And then again, so I'm, I'm a swarm roboticist, so I will look at it uh, from, from the swarm robotics point of view. And there's this nice paper um, already getting a bit old, so from 2002, uh, Christina Lerman, uh, Mathematical Modeling of Foraging in a Group of Robots, Effect of Interference. And if, if you think about uh, foraging, there's one natural problem. So there's a lot of space maybe here, so they can explore, run around, collect, uh, find and collect these objects. But then here the home is placed in a corner, so they have to come back into that corner and, and drop whatever they found there. And of course, if, if you would scale up at some time, uh, it, this area might be quite crowded, right? So there's a, a limit and, um, well, what's the cause? Each robot needs some space. Uh, so the effect is that at some time they might even block each other and you might get a deadlock, right? So then, then that would mean the system does really not scale well. And if you want to think about it, so what does it really mean uh, in general? Well, there's, there's a shared resource, right? So there's limited space. Each of the robots needs some space and certain areas can only be accessed by one robot at a time, yeah? So if you, if you think about that also in terms of uh, wireless communications, I'm certainly not an expert of wireless communication, like speaking of radio, because we usually use infrared for communication in our swarm robot systems. But then you have like the shared resources, air, right? Or, or your, your channel. And then that's why there's all this research, or uh, at least some years ago, there was very, very active research on all these different MAC protocols, if you think about like back in, in 2000, there were like, I don't know how many people published um, uh, protocols for, for sensor networks, for example. And then there's something like CSMA CA, for example, where uh, you just find a, a clever way of how to make sure that not everybody accesses this one shared resource at the same time. And then uh, in robotics, we just saw that, so okay, it's, it's shared space. And then um, you have to do some, actually also some collision avoidance, right? So CA means collision avoidance, so we do the same with the robots. Again, a shared uh, resource, not everybody can access it at the same time. And even, even in ants, uh, you have these problems. So you would guess, 
well, and for an ant, it's not so difficult. Um, uh, you know, they can even climb each other. So when should they ever have tr problems with traffic jams? But then there was this paper by Audrey Dussetour in Nature, and this is just the, the from Nature News what they um, announced back then. Uh, ants avoid traffic jams. So there's, uh, if you have like a bridge and the, the ants have to pass that bridge in, in both directions and it's getting too crowded, then at some time you could, uh, could get a deadlock, right? That they, like uh, on, in the middle of the bridge, they, they um, face each other. But then actually there's one direction that pushes the other ones away. So this is uh, the way of ants, or well, at least some ants, to um, negotiate and, and find a way to avoid deadlocks in, in these traffic jams. And the other thing, I'm well not sure how much you're still printing on paper, but that's the classical thing, right? So that only one uh, job can be printed at a time and everyone else has to queue. Okay, let's have a look into one particular system. So this is a relative, also a relatively old or let's say evergreen of uh, swarm robotics, the, the stick pulling experiment. Again, inspired by some, some ants that uh, do something similar. The main point is that the robots are supposed to pull out sticks out of the ground and um, it's just so the sticks are that long that one robot can't do it by itself. So there's two grips. The first one approaches it, uh, grips it and moves it uh, like halfway out and then it has to wait for a second one to help uh, to, to grip it down there and then it, the, the first one will release it and then it can pull it out all the way. So a very obvious uh, requirement for some kind of collaboration. One can't do it, you need two. And the question is, um, what, what is really the effect uh, in terms of scalability, for example, in the system? Because it's clear one robot can't do it, so you better have at least two robots. Maybe you want to have four, six, eight robots, but where's the limit? <coughs> so we, let's look into a little toy example here. Um, so we, we do it like this. So there are these different stick sides and we don't really model uh, everything, like how do they navigate from one side to the other. We just say uh, like this transition from one side to another side happens at some uh, period of time. So this is this T. And we can try to, to model this. So I, I will um, introduce these two functions. So uh, like the average or, or one particular transition time um, L, L stands for linear, depends on, on N, big, uh, capital N is the, the swarm size, plus some, some Xi, which is some, some noise. Or we could say, no, it will actually uh, scale quadratically, so uh, N squared will be, with some constant C, will be the time we should expect it takes a robot to, to travel from one side to the next. And maybe this is more realistic because if you have more and more robots, um, they will start to avoid each other and at some time avoiding robots will run into other robots and then you actually create this kind of traffic jam. So uh, one important thing to understand here is that you have this trade-off, right? So on the one hand, it's clear um, there's something like too few robots but there's also something like too many robots. There's certainly the sweet spot somewhere in between. So this is a, a trade-off that we face. And if you use this, this toy model, you can generate some data and, and you know, it's a very simple model. Uh, so you can get these plots. So here we have uh, the horizontal axis, which is, well, I call that the, the system size, like how many robots do you have? And then this is already some different kind of language. So we say relative capacity, but basically it's just like how many sticks are pulled out of the ground, like the, the swarm performance. And then this is uh, the performance of an individual robot. And green is linear for this linear scalability of, of the tra travel times. Blue is for the quadratic one. And then you see different things here. So first, it, it doesn't scale infinitely, right? Especially with the quadratic one, you have a peak here and then it goes down and it stays a bit uh, on this level. But that's of course really bad because you, from here to here, you're adding 10 robots and you don't really gain anything. So you wasted um, resources and, and energy. And this is also interesting because this tells you um, like going from, from two to four robots, uh, each individual robot actually gets more efficient, right? And th this is something 
kind of unnatural. So uh, we said in a, in a group of people, you wouldn't observe that. Like if you go from a group of four human beings to eight, not everybody will get more efficient, usually. So I'm, I'm proposing the following hypothesis. So uh, if you look at these shapes of these diagrams, maybe something like that is what you should keep in mind. Uh, so the, like the, the general um, scalability of these systems could be something like that. Uh, so this is the system size and this is the, the system performance. In the beginning there might be a steep increase, then there's sometimes the sweet spot and from there it will go down. Right? So you would like to avoid the whole uh, right half of this um, graph. And Sure, yeah. Good question. Uh, I don't. So this is for, for a constant number of sites. I don't actually don't remember how many, but... Huh? For any constant number of sites. I guess it would look similar uh, if, if you scale um, the number of sites. But this is like we keep the number of sites constant. But that's actually already a good point. So if we, we could scale it uh, in the same way as we scale up the, the system, right? Mm -hmm. And then maybe it, it would look differently. But but for now it's, it's like we, we keep it constant mm -hmm. and that's actually a good point. So when, when I say here system size, what, what I actually really mean is that you have, for example, your robots operating in some bounded area and if you increase system size, what you really increase is the system density, mm -hmm. right? So you actually increase the swarm density and that is something that hurts. Because so, well, people have said for, for a long time that uh, swarm robotic systems scale beautifully, uh, but it's only true if you keep the, the, the system density constant, right? Then it scales. So you can think of a, a third dimension like that goes into the screen uh, where you keep uh, the swarm density constant and then maybe it would actually scale nicely. But in, in a real system, most of the time you would actually change the, the swarm density. Um, and now some interesting questions. So is, is this type of scalability actually unique to swarm robotics? And the answer is no, not so. Uh, actually, it's really fascinating um, what you find in, in literature about that. So let's have a look. Okay, this is, this is swarm robotics again. Uh, so you can find um, some, some papers. So this is Östergaard, where they vary, for example, the, the size of the robots and then you get better scalability because each robot needs less space and then they can uh, navigate more easily. So this is of course simulation because in, with real robots you cannot just uh, change the size unless you have three different types of robots. So this is what we've seen already. Then um, in biology, uh, so there's a paper by, by Sibley and then there's this nice book by Krause and Ruxton where they say Actually, in biology, it seems for, for these animals living in groups, there must be somehow some optimal group size. Yeah? And then, well, this is, this is like coming out of blue sky. So they, they happen to draw these lines that actually look similar to uh, what we just saw. Uh, here, the point for them, for, for biology, is that they uh, say, like, okay, if there's this optimal um, group size, but then there might still an animal be allowed to, to join and maybe there's no like defense mechanism that they uh, try to defend and, and send that away. So maybe someone can join. And then you have this funny situation that maybe in, in biology or in nature you will never observe uh, this optimal group size because um, if this is like the, the fitness of an individual living alone, then it's always an advantage to join a group and, and at some time they, they will somehow end up somewhere here, right? So groups will grow and um, then you observe all these uh, suboptimal group sizes in reality. But that, that's, we, let's not spend so much time on this for now. And then uh, this is in, in networks. Uh, this is some, some simple uh, simulation of networks for different topologies and they do, uh, so here you see polarization speed. So this is some kind of collective decision making <laughs> system. And you see ex again the same curves. Maybe one interesting point is that here for this ring structure, uh, you have almost like a linear decrease here, while for this random uh, graph, 
you have this like steep, seemingly nonlinear decrease, and that's maybe also something that's worth looking into. Another example, car traffic. Um, so the quality of this graph is not so high, but we see uh, what we need to see. Uh, so this is basically the throughput, how many cars um, get through the system per time. And this is again uh, the density, like how many vehicles per kilometer do you have. And this, the curve again looks similar, right? So in the beginning you have this like steep kind of linear increase. And there's this theory, for example, of three phases in, in these uh, traffic models. So you have an initially uh, a free flow phase, then a synchronized flow, which would be, I think, uh, in this area. And at some time you have a, a wide moving jam phase. So if, if you have a big empty highway, right, you can add uh, more and more vehicles and they will just like um, drive through without really interacting. At some time it will get like critical and if it's, you have this high density and one, once one driver breaks, uh, you have this chain reaction and, and it's actually a serial uh, system, right? So you have uh, quite some correlations between one and everybody else. Um, and then if we look into psychology, this is what I mentioned, like what about human groups? You have something similar, right? So this is the size of the group and then you have this supposedly ideal um, increase, double the size, double performance. But then you have some, for example, motivation loss, which is also known as the Ringelmann e e effect. So this is um, like in, in tug of war, for example, they measure that if the group is too big, then uh, people start not to be so much motivated anymore because anyway, nobody will notice that they don't pull as hard as they can, right? So a very human thing to do. And if, if you've had as many Skype meetings in your life as I had, then you will understand this cartoon uh, that at a certain size of a Skype meeting, like 10 people, 15 people, that sometime you might prefer suicide over uh, joining, joining the, the Skype meeting but I'm, I'm kidding, right? Um, and this is maybe something really, really unexpected. So honestly, I hate chemistry, but um, when I found this, that's really interesting. So I'm not sure how much you know about electrolytes. Uh, this is about conductivity, and uh, here on the horizontal axis, we increase, um, I think, the, uh, the density of the, the salt in, in the system. And then uh, also interesting to look into the history of science of what they did there. So in the beginning they said like, yeah, it's, it's a linear increase. And then sometime they looked into these um, higher concentrations and they were like, yeah, maybe it's more like quadratic or something. Uh, and then when they measure the whole thing, they find these, these uh, shapes here and they're actually not able uh, to, to give like a good model that, that really works well. So that also points us uh, to something that it's really challenging to, to model these systems, so you do not only get the same shapes, you also get uh, some, some modeling issues. Um, so now back from this like basket of things uh, to, to quite some hard uh, computer science uh, content. So probably you had uh, the luck of, of some um, parallel programming cores uh, or maybe distributed computing or something. So you probably know what's, what's the speed up. So you do, you, you do this fraction of the latency that you have in one core system, in a one core system, like how long does it take for a given work package to, to finish, to compute it. Uh, and you can uh, put that over a latency of a P core system. So if you have P processors, uh, then you would hope for, for some speed up, right? And that's kind of what we're speaking about here. And then you have this um, situation, which is maybe something really strange. What if the speed up is bigger than P, the number of cores? So that is, would be the situation that you go from five cores to 10 cores, and you do not only get a double speed up, but more. So your system did not just uh, scale with the number of cores, but even more. And that's something for a long time people in distributed computing thought this is impossible, then, right? They would exclude that. And it's, it's like the, the perpetuum mobile of, of um, distributed computing. So let's see, right? So maybe there's some magic somewhere. Um, and then not sure if you know this guy. So I, I love his work, actually. This is, uh, I, I call him Neil Gunther. 
but probably his name is not Gunther, but in German it sounds funny. Uh, and he, he came up with this, like, okay, he calls it universal scalability <laughs> law. And it looks like this. So, so this is again an equation that, that comes out of blue sky. So not, nothing really to understand. You can just accept like, okay, this guy was creative and, and wrote this down. Uh, so this is, uh, he calls capacity, which is swarm performance, if you ask me, or system performance. And then capital N is again the, the system size. And then he has these two um, terms here, uh, one multiplied by alpha, one by beta. And alpha is what he, so there's some way of interpret this, right? He, he wrote that down somehow, but there's a way to interpret it. So alpha scales the contention in the system. So this is how much you run into problems because of shared resources. And then from a distributed computing point of view, beta uh, models the lack of coherency. So maybe you not remember from some course that if you have distributed memory, so you have like the, the copies of the same cache pages at different places, and if you do a cache write somewhere, then you you have an incoherent system, right? So there's this new uh, memory page here. All the other cores or, or other CPUs don't have that yet. So then um, you have to find some some system that updates these, these um, outdated pages and that comes with overhead, right? So this is what, what beta models. Um, it's not so easy to interpret it, uh, what it would mean in a swarm system, but maybe there's some, some relation. So what you can model with, with this um, model here is, um, for example, the, the linear speed up, right? This, this supposed ideal case, uh, double the size of the system, double output, uh, so this is then if you uh, increase alpha from, from zero, it, it will actually start to, to <coughs> bend down, um, maybe all the way to some kind of saturation. This is bigger alpha, still beta set to zero. And once you also uh, increase beta over, over zero, then it actually will go down. So that means um, your boss asked you to scale up. You invested money into new processors, and the result is that your system is slower, right? So then probably you're fired. So that's, that's why he wrote this book, uh, Practical Performance Analyst, to make sure that doesn't happen to you. And uh, maybe you also have heard about Amdahl's law <laughs> at some time, and this is actually, uh, he, he catches Amdahl's law uh, with, this, with this model. So he published that, I think, back in the 90s, and he prohibited, uh, alpha values below zero, because if you do that, something funny happens. And this is uh, what he then tried to repair um, quite a few years later, because uh, there's these, have you heard about these Hadoop systems? So uh, um, these are, well, I'm not an expert, but it's like a, like a cluster uh, for a database. So Google has these kind of systems. And there they actually measured in such a real operating system a super linear increase of performance, a super linear speed up. And that sent all these modeling people back to their desks because then they were like, okay, oh, this, this magic thing can actually happen. Uh, and Gunther was happy because uh, he just said, well, then I allow, I allow this, this parameter to be negative and then actually the, the curve looks like that and that should remind you of something, right? And then he has some, some funny language, so he says that's where, so the, he's talking about the, the black area here, uh, sorry, the red area, that's the payback zone. Uh, that's where you pay the piper for apparently getting a super linear ride for free. So maybe it's not a perpetuum mobile because um, for like here you get the super linear um, speed up, but then later you have to pay for that if you scale up your system even more. And um, if you think about what does it really, well, and the, f and the first thing we should try to uh, find, uh, do you have any idea um, in what way uh, it can happen that you have a super linear speed up in such a system? So it's a real computing system. So these are actually funny cache effects. So if you think of, like you distribute some work packages, and if you scale up, uh, then the work packages get smaller, and at some time they will just happen to fit into your cache. And this actually gives you a, a, like a non-linear increase, and, and that's why, why it looks like that. So from the computing point of view, it's, it's rather like something simple. 
And one more thing I would like to discuss with you is um, what does it really mean if, if this curve goes down? Because the only way to explain that is that, um, well, you have more and more processors, jobs, or robots uh, queuing up, right? You have a longer and longer queue, but that queue costs something. This is the only explanation of, of how it is possible that you actually have this uh, decrease. And so what you've seen in, in curing theory or even in, in some distributed computing course maybe uh, is this very well-ordered thingy, right? So uh, you have uh, jobs coming in, they queue up, and then here if you have like two cores, then you can process two jobs at a time. And I mean, they, they behave well, right? These, these like English men at the bus station, so they uh, no pushing and, and they just queue up nicely. But if you look into, for example, our swarm robotic systems, it looks more like this, right? It's like the German way of, of lining up. Um, so a pile of people, a lot of pushing. And so, so these, these two guys that are actually served right now can't really be processed uh, in the same way as if these blue guys would not be there, right? So there's some interference even within uh, queuing um, jobs or robots and those that are actually processed. And, and this is the only explanation, if you think about it, how it can be possible that you go down back there. Okay, so um, I'm kind of running out of time, but I will try to give you um, uh, my, my key idea here. So what, I'm, I'm not giving you all the details, but um, this is one idea of how you could model this, slash how like what you should have in your mind when you design <coughs> these kind of systems. And this is really my, my take home message for you. So um, if you think about how well does your swarm, your distributed system scale, you should think about something like this. So this is a very simple model. So think of it as a population model, right? You have these different agents in your system and they come uh, in different states. Some are non-collaborating. So this is like you uh, at 3 a.m. on the highway. Uh, so you can just go, if it's a German highway, uh, 250. And uh, there's no interaction with anybody else, right? So this is just you non-collaborating uh, driving uh, on, on the highway, for example. Then we have these collaborating agents, like in the stick pulling example, right? So if, if everybody would be in this state, nothing would happen. You would have zero performance. So you want to have a certain percentage of your population being in the collaborating state, uh, then they, they work together, they, they pull out some of these sticks. But then there's also the third state, uh, which is um, there it's really too crowded. There's a too high density. Maybe there's like five robots uh, standing around a stick uh, and they, they like uh, interfere with each other or it's in your, in your radio communication system. It's really like too many clients or too many um, antennas basically on, on a too small area and then you have this, this interference. And I would argue that, well, what I'm hiding here from you to some extent is, is these transitions, like how do you get from here to there. Uh, um, but this is, I think, what you should keep in mind, what's, what's happening there. And this is just a different way of visualizing this. Uh, so it's a population model. Uh, you should try, it. maybe you can measure that, maybe you can try to really model that. Um, of like who's in, in which state. Do, do, do they work as, as single agents? Do they collaborate or did they like overdo it and they can't collaborate because there are too many in, in one space. And this is, this is just half of the story. So this is now, now you know like percentages of, of, popula of your population. Um, one more thing maybe to mention is that, that these are of course, probably uh, non-linear relationships. So it's not just a very simple linear model. But what's missing is, is a performance metric. So you want to think about um, how, um, like, what, what's the benefit of having a high percentage of your population being, for example, in, in the, in the non-collaborating state. And that would be the standard case like in distributed computing, right? You want to have uh, a, a trivial parallelization, each um, processor processes its own work package and there's close to no communication. That would be the ideal case, right? So you can, um, so this is like some, some visualization. You have some function P and then you have some constant C1, C2, C3 for um, non-collaborating, collaborating, interfering. 
And you could just say, okay, those that, that work alone, they actually help us to make progress. Uh, all the others give us zero output, right? Because you don't even want to have collaborating um, agents maybe in, in some kind of simple distributed computing. If you want to collaborate, you could even say like, okay, these, these single agents help nothing. Uh, we go all for the collaborating ones. Interference is still not fortunate. Or you could combine, right? So you say, well, maybe some of these lonely robots can still do something, but if they collaborate, uh, maybe they achieve more uh, or who knows. Okay, and so uh, just I will rush through these. So if you just have this one state, you have only non-collaborating agents. Okay, then that's this supposed ideal case. Then if you have collaborating agents, what you can get out of such a model is actually something like this. So in green, you have these non-collaborating agents, and this would be um, this the standard metric that like even collaboration doesn't doesn't really help. And then this one uh, could be something where you have already some kind of nonlinear effects, so you get uh, closer to, to these shapes that we observed earlier. And then this one would be um, for, for a metric where you say, I, I get nothing from robots that work alone, uh, and all I get is from robots that work together. And then you're back to this, this shape of these curves uh, that we had before. So it's a simple model, um, a bit more than what, what Neil Gunther showed us, um, like this, this formula out of blue sky. So here you can actually understand a bit of what's happening and, and still uh, reconstruct the, the scalability of these systems. So now I, I will just skip a, a few slides. So this is my, my second last slide. Um, so you can also think of it um, in, in this way. So there's a number of trade-offs in, in any of these uh, distributed systems. So on the one hand, you of course want to make good use of your resources, right? <coughs> um, maybe it also, like in many cases, it, is, it makes sense to collaborate. And uh, you can also find examples where, where you want to share information. But for each of these points, uh, there's probably also like something contradictive that at some point you have to make sure that you also save some resources. You should maybe not always collaborate. Sometimes it's, it might be really also advantageous, advantageous to stay competitive to some extent. And maybe you should not share all information because then everybody works on the exact same problem instance, for example. And so this is just another visualization. So you have like this optimal area, like the sweet spot. And then maybe in, in, in this first uh, third, you underuse resources. Otherwise, they, they are depleted, like your shared space, for example. Maybe you're too competitive uh, and if everybody works by itself, or it's too cooperative if you have like too many robots working together, and, and so on. So this is actually really uh, all what I wanted to, to show you. Um, First, you should try to remember this, this shape of the curve. Like when you have a, a distributed self-organizing system, a swarm system, then uh, you should always expect this kind of shape for uh, performance over basically density of the system. So if you have an increasing number of neighbors, for example. Um, then queuing comes with a cost, right? It's not as nice as like these nicely queuing up um, agents. They actually interfere with each other. And also I think that's easy to understand for, for radio communication, for example. And then there's all these trade-offs. Like you want to have uh, quite a few robots to make sure they are. They have a chance to collaborate, but there's also a, a too much, right? Uh, so you think you should always think about these three states uh, and of course, now you would need to fill this with life, right? So you, this is a very abstract model, and you have to think about uh, what does it really mean for the system that I am investigating? Um, so how do I manage to make sure that robots get from this state to that state if you want to have collaboration? Uh, does that mean that they have to, to cluster or should they synchronize? Uh, so these are the, the questions you have to ask yourself uh, for your particular system. And then uh, usually you want to avoid this, this last state because this is when, when you then start to go down in, in your performance. 
And also, yeah, try to read a little bit of these papers of Neil Gunther. I think he's, he's really uh, doing a great job and he has a funny writing style. So you can also enjoy that. And hopefully you will remember something. And now I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you.